afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Hope Church. This is the house of prayer for everyone. Let's all stand together. We welcome you uh, to worshiping with us today. Hear the call to worship. This is from Psalm, uh, Psalm 30. Sing to the Lord, you saints of his, and praise his holy name, for his anger lasts only a moment, but his favor lasts a lifetime. Weeping may remain for a night, but rejoicing comes in the morning. You have turned our wailing into dancing. You have removed our sackcloth and clothed us with joy that our hearts may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord, our God, we will give you thanks forever and ever. Amen. Let us confess our faith with the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Amen. Oh, yeah. 
time so I walk so I walk upon salvation thank you Lord your spirit alive in me this life you declare your promise my soul now to stay So what could I say? What could I do? We offer this heart, oh God, completely. Oh. 
offer this sword, oh God, completely to you. Let's sing this together. I offer up my heart. I offer my heart, oh God, completely to you. I offer up my heart. I offer my heart, oh God, completely to you, Jesus. I offer my heart, oh God, completely to you. Let everything fade away. I offer my heart, oh God, oh, completely to you. Mm-hmm. Let's just stay in this place a little longer, this place of surrender. Oh, we offer up our hearts, Lord. Oh, we offer up our hearts to you. Oh, I offer my heart, oh God, completely to you. Touch my heart like you do. And I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. There is none like you. 
No one else can touch my heart like you do And I could search for all eternity long And find there is none like you There is indeed none like you, Lord. There is none like you, Lord. Lord, as we come to you in prayer, Lord, we just humbly bow before you, Lord. With arms surrendered, Lord. And our hearts aligned with you, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would just be here in our presence this day. That the Holy Spirit would come and dwell with us, Lord. That beyond just hearing your word, Lord, that we would just have a tangible experience of you, Lord. That we would feel you in our lives, Lord. That we would walk in a way, Lord, that that experience wouldn't be limited to these walls, Lord. That it would just be a part of our day, Lord. We pray that you just continue to purify our hearts, Lord. That you would sanctify us, Lord. You would create in us a clean heart, Lord. Renew a right spirit, Lord. That you would not cast us out of your presence, Lord or withhold your Holy Spirit, Lord. You would restore unto us the joy of our salvation, Lord. That our spirit would be renewed in you, Lord. We thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for, for nothing more than salvation, Lord. We're preparing a way, Lord, providing a way for us to spend eternity with you, Lord. So, Lord, we just thank you for this day, Lord. We thank you for this time together, Lord. We pray, Lord, that as we hear the word from Pastor Q, Lord, that our hearts and our minds would be aligned with you, Lord. That our focus would be here, Lord. Pray that you would just speak to us, Lord. That this would not just be something we did on Sundays, Lord. We pray, Lord, that you would just pervade every area of our lives, Lord. Lord, we just thank you, Lord, for, uh, for bringing us all together today, Lord. We pray, Lord, that as we gather to worship, Lord, again, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit, Lord, your presence would be here with us this day. That we would just cast all of our cares aside, Lord. All of the burdens of life, Lord. That we would take your yoke upon us, Lord. That we would experience the lightness that we find in you, Lord. That in all that we do, Lord, your name would be glorified. We worship you, Lord. We honor you. We ask all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, take this time to say hello to those who are sitting around you. Um, special welcome and hello to visitors, friends, special friends and family um, who are here. Or if you're here for the first time, we welcome you warmly. All right, it's warm in here, huh? 
We do welcome all of you. And uh, now for the announcements, we don't have that many. We have our um, HOP, our hour of prayer, that is um, a ministry night that happens on the last Wednesday of the month. And so that will be this Wednesday. This Wednesday, we're meeting in person here downstairs at 730. And it's a wonderful time of praise, of prayer, worship, of ministry. So please come in person. Um, it's not our usual HOP through Zoom. So come in person 730 this Wednesday. Also, there will be a congregational meeting happening on December 10th. That's on a Sunday, December 10th. It will happen immediately following our Sunday worship service. So you guys just need to come, regular worship, and then right after the benediction, we're just going to go right into a congregational meeting. The agenda is two, two items on the agenda. One is the election of deacons and elders. And then the second one is the approval of the 2024 budget. Our church budget will be coming up. Who said that? Was that you? <laughs> it's been working hard on the budget. All right, yes, yes. So uh, that is going to happen on December um, 10th. Uh, mark your calendars. You just you want to be here for that. Um, and I think that's it. At this time, we will worship through giving. As always, we have an offering uh, plate up here. And you can also use the Church Center app to give. Let's pray. Gracious God, we thank you for your goodness over us, Lord. How good it is to be in your house to worship together in spirit and in truth. We thank you, Lord, that we're able to come, not with empty hands, but, Lord, that we can give unto the ministry, that your kingdom would come here on earth as it is in heaven. Father, we thank you for our missions partner, the Browns. Father, even as they are in a time of transition at the YWAM base, we pray for your anointing and your provisions over them, God, and their family and the YWAM ministry, Lord. Father, we thank you, Lord, for your goodness and nearness, especially to those who are sick, who are hurting, Father, that are um, facing physical health challenges or even mental, emotional, or financial struggles that your people may be in. Father, would you draw near to those who are struggling? Would you bring ones around them that can encourage, support, and love them, God? So, Father, we lift up today's worship service to you. We thank you and love you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. At this time, if you, we will um, dismiss the kids, but you guys will be back. Today, we're going to have the sacrament of baptism. And so that's going to happen at the end of the service after Pastor Q's message. So I believe the kids are going to come back for that and join us. So we'll see you then. I am back. Amen. God. And I, 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 want, I need to apologize. I promised that I will do WordPress to uh, log the mission trip, but I, I was really having difficulty writing anything down. So I dumped everything in the Facebook and Instagram. And there are a whole lot more pictures and whatnot I would love to, and you want to share, but... Uh, let me just mention, just, you know, I was in two different nations, and I was in Indonesia for about, about a week, 
you know, and, and you know, we have, we have our mission partner family in, in, in Indonesia. And uh, in, in, I don't know if you knew, Indonesia is the nation with most Muslims in the world. It is a nation with most Muslims in the world. And, you know, and 85% of the people are not Christians in the nation. There are about 10 plus percent Christians as a revival, but there are many, they, are, they have 17,000 islands, about 700 plus languages where many of those islands do not, uh, places do not have the gospel preached yet. Any viable witness or not has been amazing. I visited, I visited, did a ministry and visited, I've been with a missionary, about 65 year old, single woman missionary who gave her life out there about 30 plus years. She gave up all her retirement, everything into that, uh, that ministry out there, missions out there, and she still lives with students. So, you know, the one, the, one of the girls' uh, places. And, you know, and she saw her doing ministry, was so blessed. And I was in Thailand where we have uh, five uh, different mission partners in Thailand. You know, and we have uh, Pastor Sue and Christina family in Bangkok. We have Pastor Luca and Gan in Chiang Rai, and we have Scott and Christina in Chiang Mai. We have in Mesa, we have Lana Vesquez with the Life Impact, and we have a young man from our church who is in Bangkok right now, Jeremiah. We know as a Jeremy, who is who will be getting married soon, but who is doing ministry out there. Five mission, uh, mission partner units that I got to visit to see what God is doing. I was so amazed, and I was so challenged. You know, I, I want to tell you one thing. Every morning, every morning at 5.30, Sue and have all the family have morning devotion. 5.30 in the morning. Because they leave home at 6.30 to go to school. They have devotion at 5.30. When the kids go out, they pray together at the home. They walk to school and pray at the school for the day. And I saw them living out faith. 5.30 morning devotion to start the day with, said I, one, one, one of the days I, Got to get out there. All the kids were in chip jammies, you know, and still out there. And, and like the youngest one actually was in literally with boxer short and the t-shirt, and you know, it's like with hair everywhere, and you know, having morning devotion with the family. And he actually, Pastor Sue actually wore, was literally not just a little short devotion. He was actually doing a Bible study, reading one of his big, thick ESV Bible and having devotion with the kids to begin the day in the Lord. I, I was so amazed the way they were living their life intentionally, serving God, and, and I saw, and yet one of, the, one of the things I need to say, one of the things I love in visiting nations is eating exotic food. I got my fill of exotic food this time. I did eat scorpion, all the bugs, bamboo worms, and you know, beetle, uh, beetle larvae, and all kind of things. Including, I got to eat, my wife wouldn't let me eat last time, but I got to eat alligator meat. Very chewy. It was okay. It was, and I want to try again, but you know, it's very okay. Anyway, love the people, so love what God is doing, and love the food. It was amazing. But just add one more thing. Got to worship and preach in Indonesia on the Sunday that I left. It was amazing, you know, and, and, and in, in that, I got to probably preach the shortest message ever and was able to minister to people. And I, I did see, we got, I got to see healing. I got to see deliverance. I got to see prophetic words come out, encouraging people. But when I was in Thailand, I got to worship in a, this church, in an evangelical church of Bangkok, e ECB, where I saw People from every nation worshiping together. And they were preaching about, they were preaching about the coming of Jesus Christ. So good. I was just, my heart was filled in every way. Encouraged as much as I was encouragement to others. I was really encouraged and blessed. It was an amazing time of just loving the Lord. Seeing what God is doing. Seeing how we are able to partner with all the peoples. God is good. Amen. Now, as I come back we, uh, today, I'm, begin, I'm going back to our study in the Gospel of Luke. This is our 55th 
five five fifty fifth message on Luke. We have only have faith through. But I tell you, and you know, this is one of those passages I have never preached on. I don't like to preach on, but I got to because I'm going through every passage in the book of Luke, and I'm speaking to see bigger, fuller picture of our Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, we come in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord of oh, Lord of Lord, King of Kings, our mighty God, our Savior, we come this day to worship. As all over the world, the nations and the peoples worship you today. It's the day of worship. We give you glory this morning, this afternoon, God. We say we are yours. We come. We want to see your face, hear your voice. We want your teaching. We want your truth. We want your life. We want all that you have for us, God. We want our lives to emanate and overflow with your goodness and your mercy. Make us more like you. We love you, God. I ask for brevity, the clarity. We ask your truth revealed, our life transformed. We will see you face to face. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Could you all stand? Let us rise for the reading of the word. Luke chapter 16, verse 1 through 15, reading with ESP. You can follow along on the, on the screen, if, but if you want to, you can follow along on your own, own Bible. Luke chapter 16, verse 1. He also said to the disciple, there was a rich man who had a manager or steward, and, charge, and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possession. And he called him and said to him, what is this I hear about you? Turn in, the, turn in the account of your management, for you can no longer be my be manager. The manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I am not strong enough to dig. I am ashamed to beg. I know what I shall do, so that, I went, so that when I am removed from the management, people will welcome me into their homes. And he summoned each one of his master's debtors, and he began saying to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. And he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. Then he said to another, how much do you owe? He said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. The master commanded the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. Here is a reading of our Lord Jesus Christ, teaching of our Lord Jesus Christ. Receive it as such. You, you may be seated. I stop in the middle of the passage, and because we want to, I want to, I will continue with the passage a little later. Uh, this is one of the teachings of our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, as a child of God, as a sons and daughters of God, every part of our lives we say he is the Lord. He is our God and Savior. Here in this today's passage, you know, Jesus just told a parable of the lost things. The lost sheep, lost coin, and he gave, told us a parable story about the lost son, the prodigal son. Now he turns around, tells them a sto another story, a parable of a man, a wealthy man. This man was wealthy enough to have a manager or steward. And in verse 1, it says, he also said to his disciples, there was a rich man who had a manager and charged the broad to him that this man was wasting, squandering his possessions. Let me stop right here. And I, for me, as I looked at the passage, to look at the story, there was a connection with, between this story and the story right before about the prodigal son. Remember the prodigal son took the money that the inheritance his father gave. He went to went away. And the word was he squandered his things. Same word is used here. Wasted or squandered his possession as if this steward is a prodigal steward. There's a connection here. You see that Jesus talked about the parable, parable of the, the lost son, how he came back and restored his life. And now he's talking about 
how a person of, of who we should live our lives, not wasting or squandering our lives like the prodigal has done. Apparently, this manager, steward, was wasting, squandering the, the master's possession. Right? Now, by the way, manager, steward is a person who manages somebody else's wealth. It's not yours. He does not own, he does, does not own the wealth himself, but he has a privilege and privilege of enjoying it and using it for the profit of the master. This steward forgot who he was, forgot that he was a steward, and he thought he acted as if the money belonged to him. So the master that called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turning the, turn the account of your management, saying, I want you to turn all the books in. I'm firing you. I'm firing you. you know, these days, when you get fired, they do two things very differently. My wife tells me, you know, company where somebody's let go. You know, one of the first things they do is they, you know, they close your computer. They make, make, make you what you call uh, pack everything, walk away so that you cannot do anything to the, your account or anything, right? But here, this, this manager was given time to get the account ready and turn it over to the master. He had time to get things ready. So well, as he was getting accounting ready, the manager told himself, what, am I, what, what shall I do? The, uh, since I'm being fired, what am I going to, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not strong enough to go and dig and do manual labor. He's a white collar worker. I'm not strong enough to dig. And he says, I'm, I'm too ashamed to go. I'm begging. What am I going to do? And then there was a eureka moment. I know what I will do. His wisdom, his craftiness kicked in. He said, uh, what, I know what I shall do so that I am, when I'm removed from my management, from my job, People will welcome me into their homes. Look at the, listen to the line. People welcome me into their homes. Right? That's not that important because that's going to come a little later. And so he called all the people who has a debtor to the master. These people are not poor people. Actually, he says, and one of the guys comes in, how much do you owe my master? You know, he says that 100 measures of oil. This is not a little measure. It's a huge barrels of oil. These are big farmers. I'm not, it's a, how many hundred? Write down 50. You know, you know what he's doing? He is not currying favor. So I'm, I'm giving you a favor so he, he will show favor to him a little later. And he said to another person, how much do you owe? 100 measures of oil, wheat. He's a huge bushels of wheat, but not, he's a big farmer. And he said, take the bill and write down 80. But here is a punchline. Here's a surprise of the story. Right? Verse 8, the master commanded him, commanded the dishonest manager of his shrewdness. What I, you know, I said, what, what? This is a surprising, surprise of the parable. The shocking, unexpected conclusion is that the master praised this guy, not because he is, not because what he did was good, not because he was, he was a thief, not because he was a, you know, irresponsible, wasteful guy, but because how he acted wisely, shrewdly in his circumstance and to care for himself and whatnot. And so now look at how the way Message Version puts it. I love the way Message Version puts it. It is always tasty. Verse 8. Now here is a surprise. The master praised the crooked Manage. He says, called him crooked manager. And why? Because he knew how to, to look after himself. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than law abiding citizens. They are on constant alert, looking for angles, surviving by their wits. The master was praising him, not for what he did, but because he was using his situations to act wisely. Look out for himself. 
So what is this story about? Why, what is this parable about? What is Jesus saying about here? And verse 9 through 15, Jesus gives some lessons about money, about wealth in our life. Money and wealth. And this is an important part of life. You know, you know, I don't know if you all know this, but Jesus talked about money and wealth more than other things. Many places talked about in Matthew 5, in the Sermon on the Way, he said, do not worry about what you're going to eat or drink. And he's talked about, you know, you know, do not lay up your treasures on earth where you can, you'll be stolen, but lay your treasures in heaven. He talks about money and finances all the time because it's what we are all concerned of. All of our life, we, the money is, in, wealth is in, money is important. Something that I do not like to talk about. So why, sometimes I wonder why I do not like to talk about because I know why. Somehow, somewhere down the line, I, I, I got this idea that I don't know who put that in me. That all pastors talk about is money. Give more money to the church, whatever. And I don't want to be one of those. This is I always avoided passages about money and things. Yet, unless we understand what money means to us, how we are supposed to live before God and how we are supposed to handle it, we cannot be fully the followers of Jesus Christ. Amen? This is important. Now, so, uh, let me begin with the biblical truth. This is a biblical truth we need to start with. Number one, God owns all. God is the author of all, and, and all, and all that we have is from God, and we are, we are stewards, managers of all that God has entrusted to us. This is what a Christian's understanding of our life is. I, what I have is not my own. It's all given from God. By God, it is, to be, it is supposed to be used for his glory and for his honor. And thirdly, there will be accounting of what he has done, how we have used all that he has entrusted to us. There will be accounting. When you, when, you are, when you stand before God, when you are supposed to give accounting for your life and how you have lived, your finances were not, what, and how will you stand before God? How will you stand? It's a scary question. So God owns it all. We are called to be steward, managers of what God has entrusted to us. And there will be an accounting as to what we did, how we live with all that he has entrusted to us. I like what John MacArthur says. I, I, I have a hate and, hate and love relationship with this pastor in California. He's a great Bible teacher that things I do not like, what he says, I disagree, but this thing I like. All Christians are but God's stewards. Everything we have is on loan from the Lord. And trust to, and trust to us for a while, to us, for a while to use in serving him. I think he put it really right. It is t- temporally given to us for use, so that we can use it as serving him, a purpose in it. As I said, mentioned, steward does not own anything. Steward does not own the wealth himself. He has the privilege of enjoying it and using it to, for the profit of the master. And the Bible says in 1 Corinthians, Corinthians chapter 4, verse 2, the most important thing about steward is that he serves his master faithfully. Look at this verse, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 1 and 2. This is how one should regard us as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. Moreover, it is required of stewards that they found faithful. Steward, you, the, your main requirement is to be faithful to what you were given to you. Now, he, Jesus gave three lessons about money and wealth in our life. Number one. Use money for eternal purposes. The Lord calls Christians to use their money, wealth, and all that are entrusted to them for eternal purposes to produce heavenly rewards. Look at verse 9. And I tell you, Jesus says, make friends for yourselves by means of unrighteous wealth. 
so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. Let me stop right here. I love this verse there, but in some, so this, this passage is, by the way, is one of the most debated passages in the whole Bible. And many commentators disagree about how to interpret this thing, you know, and, and about how Jesus commanded praise that, that, uh, that, that unrighteous steward and all that. Anyway, look at what he says here. Make friends for yourselves. I, I look at the way that message puts it. I want, you, I want you to be smart in this. I like the way it puts it. I, li- I want you to be smart in the same way, but for what is right. Using every adversity to stimulate you to creative survival. To concentrate your attention on the bare essentials so you will live, really live. Like somebody, somebody in our church always talks about fully alive. And not complacently just get by on good behavior. This is how message version puts it. Jesus says, here, use wisely and use, you know, use the, uh, the money, the wealth God has given you for eternal purposes. The few things I want to highlight, look at verse 9 again. I highlight in the, in the and, and I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of right, unrighteous wealth, so that when it fails, they may receive you into eternal dwellings. There is eternal consequences of how we live our life, how we use our finances, how we use, we use money. The eternal bearings of how we use. And Jesus says, use it for eternal purposes here. Look at that. It says, says is, is it funny? It says that they may receive you into eternal dwelling. As if it almost sounds like if you, well, how you handle your finances will take you into heaven. Doesn't it sound like that? But that's not what he's saying here. But, but the point here is that there's eternal consequences. But look at some of the places in the Bible. Look at what Jesus says. To a young rich ruler who came and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said, just, Jesus had told him, if you would be perfect, he did, he did, he lived morally righteous life following all the laws, but he said, I feel, felt something missing. Jesus tells him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor, and you will have treasures in heaven. And come follow me. Jesus told him, it's more than following the laws and doing what is right. There's something about here giving up your things for the kingdom of God. And look, did you look at the 20, 12, verse 33. Jesus says here in, in, in the Sermon on the Plains, he talked about to not be anxious about life, what you're going to eat. Instead, seek first his kingdom. And then, then he says, sell your possessions, give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that do not grow old, with a treasure in the heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. There's something about investing my well, earthly wealth for God's kingdom for eternal purposes, especially in the ways of and that we're caring for the poor and the weak and the hurting, that there's internal eternal consequences. Jesus said, your, where your treasure is, your heart is there also. Second, and, 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 and so here also Jesus says, make friends, with, for your, make friends for yourselves with unrighteous wealth. Make your, make your friends with your unrighteous wealth. Uh, right, the wealth which belongs to this world. Use that. To make friends for yourself. Verse 9, right? I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth. You must use our resources of finances and money to gain eternal friends. Not enough just to give some money, but devote our belongings so that we will make eternal friends as well. One of the things that we teach, we study, we talk about in the living life those in the living life Bible study, I missed you. I was away for two. You know, we missed, I missed two sessions. Pastor Mimi filled in. 
I want to be begun by saying the most important thing in life is what? Come on, living life Bible said to students. Most important thing in life is what? Come on, living life students, come on. Relationship. Relationship. The greatest commandment was love the Lord your God with your heart, soul, and mind, and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Relationship. Is it not true that so often we value money more than people and friendships and relationships? Isn't that true? Often we will betray our friends for the sake of money and wealth. This is not to be so. And, and, the, and the thing is, surely relationship is more important than money. Isn't that true? Jesus says here, make friends with Make, make friends for yourselves the, with the means of unrighteous wealth. With the unrighteous wealth, make friends, eternal friends. It's about the life that you call call us to live. Lo love your neighbor, yourself, and, and, your, and, and talks about eternal purposes in using the resources. But the, you know, the, often we value money over people and relationship. But the greatest comm greatest commandment says, "Love your neighbor." Right? Look at this verse, Proverbs nineteen seventeen. Whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord, and He will repay him for his deeds. When you give to the poor, you know what the Bible says: you are lending it to God, and God never not repay. He always pays back with interest far greater than you have expected. When you give to the poor, when you help the poor, when you give, use your resources for the poor, you are lending it to God. There is laying treasures in heaven. There is investing in the eternity where, where it's about relationship with those and, and loving those around. When we are generous to the poor, we lend to the Lord. He will surely repay us. Amen? He will surely repay us. It cannot be just me living for myself, my own needs and what I want. It is more than that. Second lesson Jesus gives here is faithful in little, faithful in much. If you, are, if you can be faithful in little things, you will also be found faithful in bigger things. Verse 10, one who is faithful in in a very little is also faithful in much. The one who is dishonest, honest in a very little is dishonest in much. Whoever can be trusted with very little thing can also be trusted with much. Let me ask you, can you be trusted with God's things? Can you be trusted with little things of God? Jesus says, then you can be trusted with greater things, greater wealth from God. Look at verse 11. If then you have not been faithful in the unrighteous wealth, who will entrust you with the true riches? If you cannot, if you cannot be trusted with the world on the earth, this world that is on the earth, which is corrupted, being, being what you call decaying, how can you be trusted with true wealth? Can you be trusted with wealth here? Then, or about, then, then you can be trusted with true wealth. Look at verse 20. If you have not been faithful in what is in some on others, on others, who will give you what is your own? If you cannot be faithful to somebody else's, manage somebody else's thing, which you need to be accounted, be accounted for, how can you be trusted with your own thing? And Jesus said, if you have been faithful with the wealth of this world, then you can be trusted with the true riches. Listen, we want, we, if we want God, we, I, want you, I want you to give me more, more blessings. You are not faithful in the little. Why should you be trusted with more? Why should, why should you be trusted with more? 
Somebody said this, I like, somebody said, I don't have the PowerPoint for this, but I should have made it. He says, what is yours is mine, I will take it. Selfish says, what, what is mine is mine, I will keep it. A Christian must say, what is mine is a gift from God, I will share it. Let me say it again. Wasn't it good? Because it's not mine. I, not somebody else. Okay? I, I thought it was good. Thief says, what is yours is mine. I will take it. Selfish says, what is mine is mine. I will keep it. A Christian must say, what's mine is a gift from God. So I will share it. Amen? Isn't that good? I like that. I need to put that on the pop, you know, Facebook or something. Third, third and final lesson Jesus gives about money and finances. We're going to talk about more of this many weeks down the line because next about three, four weeks, messages are on about finances that Jesus talks about. Third point is this. You cannot serve God. Both. You cannot serve both God and money. You cannot have two masters. You cannot have only one boss. Verse 13, no servant can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and the love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot have two masters. You cannot do it. If you are running after money as if it, will, and it controls you, you cannot serve God. I love the way somebody put it this way. Your wallet needs to be baptized as well as your body to make a real disciple. I'm connecting it to today's baptism, okay? okay? Even your wallet needs to be baptized. Listen, is your money, is Jesus Lord of your money and your wealth and finances? Are you, ask, are you thinking, what am I going to do? What, what am I going to do what I, with what I have? Or are you asking God, what shall I do with what you have entrusted to me? How shall I use this? How shall I use this for your glory? It's very different how Christian looks at the things in this world. We are, he, we are, he owns all. We are just called to be steward, manager of it all. Let me be honest. One of the things I thought about as I traveled, you know, you know I'm, I'm getting to age where I'm in now in 60s, okay? So that, you know, retirement is not far down the line. Within the next 10 years, you know, you know I, 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 I must retire, right? And, and, and so, anyhow, so I'm really, in, in many ways, you know, actually, everywhere I look, I see, I went to, when I stopped at, you know, the Incheon uh, airport, I looked at, went into the bookstore there, and they had books about how to live your 50s, how to live your 60s, how to live your 70s. These things are catching my eyes. How do you live your life when you're getting older? Right? How, and I, mean, I know they are not written by Christians, but the thought, how shall I live my life? And with understanding who I am before God, how shall I live? This is why I was amazed at the woman, the missionary Deborah came in Indonesia. 65-year-old lady, never married. She's been out there 30 plus years and and she told me that she, I heard the story where she did get a, you know, you know what do you call, a housing allowance in Korea where she got an apartment, you know, getting an apartment is a big thing in Korea. And she sold it to put it into the ministry. And she has no retirement plans whatsoever. 65-year-old woman living a life to, so that for the kingdom of God, working with the young people in Indonesia, sharing the gospel, helping them or not. And she's making sure that things are not hers. It's all God's. She's living a life, laid out life. You know, and the thing is, that's a good life. Maybe not in the world. And it's, it, people may say, you are foolish. You have no retirement plans. How are you going to live when you retire? But the thing is, she's living her life every moment before God. I wish you like to another way somebody put it. Until Christian's money has been committed to the Lord, Christian's life isn't really committed at all. I mean, I think I told this story about four years ago. About four years, years ago, 2019, I was in Kona with a number of Korean American leaders, second, you know, young, younger and old, younger leaders plus older leaders. 
And I was, I was supposed to be fathers in the midst of them. I, I guess I'm old. And so uh, I met this guy named Charlie Shin. I don't know if anybody knows who Charlie Shin is. Have you been to um, Philly Steak Cheese? There are over 600 locations in, in America. He's also the guy, he, he's, he's a founder owner of that Philly Steak Cheese. Charlie Shin, I met this guy. He was there as one of the leaders and talking with those young people. And he's also the founder and owner of BB Bob's as well. And he, I mean, I remember, and as I, just, I remember four years I shared his devotional method. I, I saw when I went to Mark's house and I saw Kay have it on the refrigerator. Yeah, I shared that with you. I remember he told this story when he was in late teens. He really had a desire, oh, God, I want to make money. So he, he was, his mom is a Christian. He's a Christian. He went to church and prayed, God, if I want to make money. If you, will, if you make me rich, I will give you 50%. He felt really good when home. On the way to home, he felt really bad. He, he didn't feel, he, he felt unsettled. He went back and said, God, I'll give you 60%. He went back. And he went back and said, I'll give you 70%. Finally, he said, God, I'll give you 100%. You know, and, and, and when he was 22, he owned two restaurants. And he now is 600 plus, plus about 50 plus BB Bob's all, 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 all over the United, United States. I saw this man, he talked about how in his office he has, wife is at, is at desk on the corner, and his daughter as well, they are always looking into how they could invest and give to people in need. You know, they really look into that, they'll visit and do that. He said, all the money that making, he says, he says, he says oh, it's not mine. I, I, God granted me ability to make riches based for God's kingdom. He lived with that in mind. You see, it's not about how much money you make. It's about who is Lord of it all. Is Jesus Lord of your money? Is Jesus Lord of your talent, your time, all of it? And are you using it for God's glory? That's what Jesus is talking about. That steward was not, was wicked guy. He's a wicked man, but he was wise about how he used whatever he, what, what, his circumstances, look out for himself, preparing, but Jesus said, you see the wisdom, I want you to do it right way, but use the wisdom in the right way. Prepare yourself, your life, live your life in wisdom, preparing for eternity. You know, and, 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 I need to add a couple more things yeah, so to finish the story. In verses 14 and 15, there were, and there were Pharisees in the midst, always uh, critics in the midst. When the Pharisees, a, a money, money obsessed bunch, MSG version says, heard him say these things, they rolled their eyes. How do you roll your eyes? Dis dismissing him as hopeless, out of touch. They were saying, just, you don't know what you're talking about. You're just a rabbi. You don't know what life is about. You need money and everything. Well, now he's saying, and then Jesus spoke to them, you are masters at making yourselves look good in front of others. But God knows what's behind your appearance. God knows what's in your heart. Society sees and calls monumental, but God sees through and calls monstrous. God knows your heart. God knows what is in it. Is it greed, envy, and lust? Our motivations, our desires, which are crooked, whatever it might be. Jesus said, what is exalted among men, what people go after, desire, value highly, is abomination in God's sight, but in God's eyes is monstrous, evil, and can be just disaster. Question is, and the point is, you cannot serve both God and money. You can only serve one. Is Jesus, is God the master of your life? Is Jesus master of your money? You can't have, you can't have two bosses. Final thought and question is this. What are you doing with? What are we doing with our money? I think we, we should look at the question. Think about it. I should rephrase it. What are we doing with all that God has entrusted to us? We change the question, isn't it? 
It's not what are we doing with our own money. What, what are we doing with all that God has entrusted to me? Let me ask you, where is your heart? Is, is your wallet baptized? What does your finance say about your, your devotion, your heart, your conviction of your life? What does your finances say about who is a boss in your life? Is, something, is, is that what God could bless? Is it something what God will encourage and strengthen? If he is Lord of our life, he is Lord of all. Not only on two hours a Sunday, every minute, every hour, every talent, every resources, every relationship, every money and dime and dollars that I have, all, he is Lord of it all. Amen? God is good. In light of talking about is your wallet baptized, we are going to celebrate a great celebration today. Our church believes in two sacraments, which is two acts of worship, you know, um, sacred acts of worship. And we, one is baptism, one is communion. Next Sunday, we're going to celebrate communion. Today, we are celebrating baptism. Baptism, baptism is when we identify ourselves with Christ, what he has done on the cross, and how he shed his blood and died on the cross for us. And we give ourselves to following him and loving him. Oh my goodness. I just, oh, oh, you're right inside. Okay. Always goes inside here. This thing is over. I, I, should, I should have it what they call stapled to my gown. Want to look holy? <laughs> you know, the reason we are wear gowns is so that we are in many ways, hiding us, so only Christ will be, be exalted. Anyway, we are today we are baptizing a little baby, Rani Judah Minu Choi. Yes, I remember his holy name. He has four parts to his name. Rani Judah Minu Choi, right? And we'll be baptized as infant. Today also we are having uh, Nia Duong, Nio who is reaffirming his baptism, meaning he was baptized in our church when he was in teens, you know, and he is now reaffirming the baptism he has received a number of years ago. And he's once again saying, Jesus is Lord of my life, Jesus is King, Jesus is my Savior. We are doing that today. All right, um, could, I have the, could I have those be, being baptized? infant and the parents and the sponsors to come forth as well as the one who is re re reaffirming his faith come forward as so Jason is wearing his gown as well his son is being baptized so today we are doing something very special and 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 and, and as we baptize you can come in front. As you, as, as you get baptized, as, as, uh, can Ronnie come? Ronnie come? As Ronnie is being baptized, and uh, Pastor Jason is our ordained minister, he wants to put water on his son. I said, we have no problem with doing that. Okay. You know, sponsors are, in Catholic Church, they call it a God, Godfathers, Godmothers. Yeah, yeah, so that in, in, the, in the Protestant church, we say sponsors, those are sponsoring his faith. You can come and stand. Okay, all the family, you're, you're standing with Ronnie you know, and his baptism as well as the whole family. Okay, if anybody, any, anyone else want to stand with uh, Neil or so, Neil, can you come a little bit to, to your left? Okay, all right. 
All right. I want you to hear what the word of God says. Jesus said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. As you are going, therefore, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I commanded you. Behold, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Jesus promised in God, in Jesus Christ, God promised to forgive us our sins. He has delivered us from darkness into light and to the kingdom of his beloved son. In Jesus Christ, God has promised to give his Holy Spirit to us, in, in, living in us and dwelling in us. And in Christ Jesus, God makes us part of the family of God, body of Christ. By water and the Holy Spirit, we are made members of the body of Christ. All right. Just look at me. Just look at me. Let me do this. I'm going to come in the front. I can see you a little bit. I'm going to talk to um, Ronnie, the parents and the sponsors, all you're standing with Ronnie. See, Ronnie is too young to understand what's happening. He's brought forth as into the covenant relationship with God on the basis of the faith of the parents. He's brought in just as when, when Abraham believed whole family, son, all man, all the men in the family were circumcised and brought into the covenant. He is brought into the covenant according to the faith of the parents. When he's old enough, he will make his own confession. Okay? In presenting this child for his baptism, you, his parents, and the sponsors speak for him as he begins his journey of faith, confessing Jesus' name before man and woman and promising to raise him in God's ways until he himself trusts in him with his own joyful heart and go, to serve, go out to serve him as faithful disciple. I want to ask you a few questions. Will you pray for him? Draw him by your example into a community of faith and walk with him in the way of Christ? We will. Will you care for him and help him to take his place within the life and the worship of Christ Church? Amen. Amen. We're going to ask uh, one of the parents have a little short testimony about what baptism for Ronnie means. I will try to be quick. When Hannah and I first got married, uh, we received a prophetic word, and it's been our guidepost for as long as we've been married. The word was this, if you take care of my house, I will take care of yours. And if you guys know the journey we've been on, um, getting Ronnie was not always the easiest thing. Um, but I am thankful because this was the ultimate group project where Hannah did 100% of the work. All I did was sign my name, and we both got credit. So thank you, wife and all husbands. Thank your wives afterwards. Um, but when we were getting ready for Ronnie, Hannah prayed, and she felt strongly that Ronnie was going to be very joyful and a source of joy for us and for many others. Um, and so we were doing some research on names. And if you Google Ronnie, you'll get two answers. One is a Hindu goddess. That's not Ronnie. Uh, the other one is the he Hebrew definition, which means song of joy. And he is indeed our song of joy. Um, and Nehemiah 8.10 says that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. And so it's not the discipline of the Lord. It's not the fervency of the Lord or the zeal of the Lord. It's always the joy of the Lord. And so this is who Ronnie has been for us. I've heard the voice of God very clearly, as clear as day, twice in my life. The first was when God told me that he loved me. And the second was last year when God told me that we were going to have a child this year. And... Um, no matter what the doctors said, uh, good news or bad news, I knew that he was going to be healthy and strong, and so he is now. 
I would be a liar if I told you that I didn't care about him doing well in school, getting good grades, um, and with his height, uh, aspiring to be the first NFL starting quarterback or an all pro NBA point guard because he's gonna be tall. Um, but more than any of those things, what we truly desire, Hannah and I, is that he would love God with all of his heart, with all of his soul and all of his mind. I, <clears throat> I'm okay. And so this is what today is about. We declare as his parents that Ronnie belongs to the house of God, that he belongs to the family of God, and that as a family, we declare Joshua 24, 15. For me and my house, we shall serve the Lord. Ronnie, may mommy and daddy's ceiling be your floor, and may you be driven by the heart of God for all of eternity. This is the house church coming around. Mia, okay. Mia, in presenting yourself for the reaffirmation of your baptism, you announce your faith in Jesus Christ. Amen. He's going to give a short testimony what baptism means to him. I was once lost, but now I'm found. Such beautiful words with great meaning. I've always thought, no matter what I did, I would always have God's blessing. I used to believe that I don't need prayer and to read the word as long as I have God in my heart. I was in a marriage for 10 years. I tried to keep my faith, but slowly it died. At a different church that I attended, I received judgment and gossip because I was married to a non-believer. Church members started asking, aren't you supposed to be Christian? Such words can be dangerous for a believer who lost his ways. My prayers turn into cursing God. My daily devotions turn into feeding the flesh instead of feeding the spirit. I was no longer a believer of the faith, nor I was considered a Christian. I felt the harshness of the world and no love from the church. I began to hate the church my heart became broken and cold, trying to hold on to my marriage, to my worldly ways. Struggles after struggle, started to feel better alone and isolated. I often asked why would God allow me to be mistreated like this? I never thank God for any good things that happened to me because I believe I did it on my own strength. I believe that I could make it in the world without God. Boy, was I wrong. My now ex-wife has left me at my darkest moments. I fell into deeper depression while keeping a fake smile so no one would see personal and mental health issues were overwhelming. Guilt and shame from past mistakes were unbearable. There were times where I wanted to kiss the world goodbye. Even a knife seems much more friendly than people. It was around March this year, I met my old high school Bible study teacher, Alam. I shared my story and he invited me to house church. I told, I told him I'll give God 12 months to change my mind about him. I need everything to be fixed and cleared. 
after 12 months. If I don't see changes, I would forever close the door on God. God broke me literally a few weeks after coming to House Church. I accepted my Lord and my Savior, Jesus Christ, back into my life. started to feel his everlasting love through the people of House Church. It was through House Church that I learned to forgive myself and letting go of my past. My curses turned into praise, giving thanks to God. I felt the joy of being in his presence again as I read his words and pray daily. I want to thank my Lord Jesus Christ for never giving up on me and for his relentless love. His mercy is new each day. I want to thank my family for also not giving up on me and for always being there for me, especially when I'm hungry. I thank my house, church, family for accepting me with open arms standing with me through all the ups and downs. I love you all very much. So like I said before, I'm lost, but now I'm home. Neil and Ronnie and all who are standing with them, I want you to hear what God says. One of my favorite words in the word of God. He says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you so that you would go and bear fruit. And this fruit will remain. He said, I chose you. And even Ronnie, who does not know anything, God says, I chose you before you ever knew me. God says to you, Neil, that it was not you just coming back. He chose you way before. It was you. He was he who was drawing you back unto him and with his kindness. He called you long ago. Now he has brought you this time, this place, so that you may confess his name before men and women and go out to serve him as his faithful disciples. I ask you, therefore, to reject sin and profess your faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to ask you uh, to confess... Uh, um, uh, confess your faith together. Uh, confess your faith as you <clears throat> respond to these questions. Do you take Jesus Christ as your only Lord and Savior? Parents, as sponsors, Neil and everybody standing with him. <clears throat> Do you trust him with all of your life? Do you intend to be Christ's faithful followers, obeying his word, showing his love to your life's end? Do you promise to be faithful members of the congregation of God, giving of yourself and in every way? Do you promise to seek the fellowship of the church wherever you may be? I want to speak to all of you as a part of the body of Christ. We can understand. They are, they are not only making covenant with God, and we are, of course, joining in this covenant as well. Our Lord Jesus Christ ordered us to teach those who are baptized baptized. Do you, the people of this church, promise to tell these new disciples the good news of the gospel to help them know all that Christ commands and by your fellowship to strengthen their family ties with the family of God? Yes. Amen. You may be seated. Father, we thank you so much for your grace. It was you known us, chosen us before anything else. It was you who drawn us to you, yourself. We thank you for the salvation and the hope that is in Christ Jesus. We thank you, Father God, for this day. As we come today as a Ronnie, as a little one, be baptized into Christ, into the covenant relationship with God, based upon the faith of the parents, God, as Neil reaffirm his faith and trust in you as his Lord and Savior. May you be glorified and honored here. May your presence touch and for the strength and Father, God, I pray you will seal all these things in your grace. 
We love you, God. We give you glory, God. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. We're going to baptize uh, Ronnie. And I'll just come. Pastor Jason, as a father of the son, his son, Ronnie, will baptize. It's okay. Nobody wants to know. Nobody needs to know that he fought it. <laughs> A little more water. You want to pray? Father, we give Ronnie to you as his parents. We say he belongs to you anyway. And so we thank you for the privilege of walking with him and nurturing him and encouraging him towards you, Father. We bless you. We thank you for today. We pray for Ronnie that, God, he would truly be the song of joy. And we pray that he would be one who knows you, loves you with all of his heart, soul, mind, and strength, and runs hard after you, fearless, because he knows that he is loved by you. In Jesus' name, amen. You want to pray, to pray for Neil right now as he uh, stands before God and reaffirms his faith and, and in Christ and reaffirms his baptism in Christ. Father, we just come and lift up Neil, God. Father, I thank you that you are, you are always with him. You were with him when he was baptized a number of years ago. And you were with him even when he struggled and when he and really stumbled in his ways. But God, you it was you who brought him back. And you touch him right now as he reaffirms, his, recommit his heart and life to you, God. Father, I pray that all that you have done on the cross, all that you accomplished on the cross, Lord Jesus, will be fully be released. And he will grow and walk as son of God, serving you with all of his heart, as faithful follower of Christ Jesus our Lord. Help him to stand firm, God, until he see you face to face. He will stand firm, giving you glory, being a light unto this world, and testimony of your goodness to this world, God, and being the son that you called him to be. We lift him up before you. We thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen, amen. Now, we, I declare, you are now disciples of Jesus Christ. He has commissioned you to live in his love and serve him. Amen. Amen. Could, uh, could all the congregation rise and welcome them into the body of Christ? Okay. It's not official until I give you a certificate. Okay, there's a certificate of baptism. The Succession of Hope Church, Clarksville, Maryland, certifies that Ronnie Judah Minu Choi, child of Jason Choi and Hannah Chia Choi, born in the 27th of May 2023, was baptized into the church university on the 26th day of November 2023. All right. You may all go back in. Let's all stand. Let's sing our final chorus together and we'll uh, end our worship service together. So I walk upon salvation Your spirit alive in me This life you declare your promise my soul now to So I walk upon salvation You spirit alive in me This life you declare your promise my soul now to stand 
So what could I say? Mm -hmm. What could I do? Who will offer this heart, oh God? Completely to you. So I'll stand with arms high and hold abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. So I'll stand, my soul, Lord, to you surrendered. All I am is yours. So I'll stand. With arms high and heart abandoned in all of the one who gave it all. So I'll stand my soul, Lord, to you surrendered all I am is yours. Yes, God, all I am is yours. It was your grace, your, your mercy. God who so loved the world. That is us, God. You gave your only one and only begotten Son. So whosoever believes in Him, trusts in Him, shall not perish but have everlasting life. We thank you for your grace and mercy. We thank you for the joy and salvation that is in Christ Jesus. Thank you for the life you have granted us, God. We worship you. We honor you, God. Let your name be lifted up to the ends of the earth. Your faithfulness, your kindness to none to all. We love you, God. We thank you, God. Now the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, love of God the Father, and the communion and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit of God be upon all who are baptized, who have confirmed their faith, and be upon all who are gathered together in worship. Be upon all church from now until forever and ever. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. Amen. Amen.